and, um, and that would be great. We are beginning um, the new ser- uh, sermon series called The Climb. We started last week, and we're going to continue throughout this week, and we are in the book of Philippians. And so if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there to the book of Philippians. If you were here last week, you will remember that we ended with the idea that Paul, despite his difficult circumstance, and despite dealing with difficulties um, with the church at Philippi, he took a moment to pause and give thanks and pray. Give thanks and pray. And as we go about our New Year resolutions, as we go about uh, growing as an individual, we can't lose the perspective that prayer and thanksgiving bring to our lives and to our minds and to our attitudes. And so uh, the first part of the uh, book that we read last week, we saw that Paul was able to pray for the church at Philippi, and he was able to give thanks for them in the partnership. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Paul, as he's writing the, the, um, the book of Philippians, he's actually in prison. We referenced that last week in Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Paul's in prison, and yet the major theme for the, the Philippians is joy. And so he's probably at the worst part in his life, and yet Paul was still able to have the right perspective of joy. And so here he is in prison. He's writing between about 61 and 63 AD. And the church at Philippi is a mature congregation. They have elders, they have deacons, and they are about 10 years old. And so this church is, gro- is growing and they're strong, but yet they have a problem. And their problem, their main problem, is disunity. We know that Paul was not only uh, in prison, but he was in a kind of house arrest. So he wasn't necessarily in jail. And if you read the book of Acts, towards the book of Acts, chapter 28, verse 16, uh, Luke testifies this. He says, when we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who guarded him. And so when you were under Roman guard, you actually were, more often than not, chained to uh, a Roman guard. And so he would be your guard for his period of time, for his shift, I guess, if you will. And so each of you would be attached to a chain. And one of the reasons why they took guarding their prisoners so seriously is because if your prisoner escaped, you would die. They would kill you. You were under a death sentence. And so despite Paul being under house arrest, he is chained to a prison guard and he's writing about joy. Now put yourself in that circumstance and in that situation. If I had to go to prison, it would be one of the worst experiences of my life. I think we could all say the same thing. Even more so, the prisons in the Roman times were much different than ours. You see, our tax-paying dollars pay for the prisoners today. If you wanted to eat, if you wanted to change of clothes, if you wanted to be taken care of, you actually had to do it on your own. People had to actually take care of you. And so that's one of the reasons why Paul was writing the book of Philippians is because the church at Philippi decided to send Paul a generous gift. In fact, if you look at a map, Philippi was in the region of Macedonia. They were one of the only churches that supported Paul's mission work. They sacrificed and they gave And they empowered Paul to do great mission work. And so here he is in Rome. And one of the questions that's probably on their minds is this. Okay, Paul, we sent you some money, but you're in prison. Is our gift really going to be that effective? In other words, is there a better way that we could take our money and put it to use in a different way? Maybe to somebody who's not in prison. After all, how much missionary work can you really get done being under house arrest in your chains? And so Paul wants to write back to them. And he wants to say, look, thank you for your generous gift. And I've got good news for you. The gospel goes on. In fact, as we'll see, because of my imprisonment, the gospel has actually advanced in different ways to new people that it would not have advanced to before. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to start here in verse 12. Now, the church of Philippi sent somebody that was very near and dear to them. Epaphroditus is the name. And this person was able to take the generous gift of Paul. Epaphroditus, as we'll see as we go throughout the book of Philippians, almost died in his work for the gospel. And so they not only want to know, how's our gift doing? How are you doing, Paul? How's your work going? But how is our dear friend? We heard that he was sick. And so starting in in verse 12, here's what Paul has to say. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. My imprisonment. And remember, he was imprisoned, not because he broke the law, but because he preached Christ. And verse 13, it says, So that it has come known throughout the entire imperial guard, and to all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ. 
And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, what an incredible perspective here, and that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. As we talked about last week, Paul started off his letter with thanksgiving and with prayer. And remember what I said, I said thanksgiving and prayer provide the right perspective. Well, what kind of perspective is that? Well, what kind of perspective does Paul have? Is it a human perspective? Absolutely not. It's a divine perspective. Paul is able to see himself as he truly is, not through his own eyes or through the eyes of those around him, whether good or bad, but it's through the eyes of God. He looks at his imprisonment, imprisoned for false reasons, slandered, hated against, lied about, and yet he says this is actually good because it's going to advance the gospel. Now, you want to talk about a divine perspective, only prayer and thanksgiving could really provide that kind of perspective on our circumstance or our situation. And look, a lot of us are in a situation this year that we don't necessarily want to be in, whether that's in our jobs or in our families or with our own body or our own spiritual maturity. Those are some of the things we talked about last week. Yet we need to pause and ask this question, what is God's perspective? What is God's perspective on my circumstance and on my situation? And how can I use that? And how can God use me to advance the gospel? And so Paul is able to see himself in this situation. And you know, that's the interesting thing about what the Bible has to say about God is over and over again, it gives us this idea that God sees things differently than we are. The Church of Israel, 700 years before Jesus was born, uh, the northern kingdom was being destroyed by the Assyrians. The Assyrians were one of the most treacherous, evil uh, kingdoms that you could ever imagine. They did horrific things to their enemies. And God had Isaiah the prophet prophesy and preach and teach the kingdom of Israel during one of their most difficult times. And he told them this in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 8. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. When Israel was first looking for a king, when they first started out, to be a king in ancient times, number one, was an incredible honor, but they looked for a certain kind of person. They wanted him to be tall. They wanted him to be handsome and strong, a fierce warrior. I mean, that's the embodiment of a king. Yet God told his his prophet, he says this, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature. Don't look on the outward things. Look at what I look at. God says, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, I couldn't help but think about my children this week as I was thinking about this idea, and that I see my children in ways that they will never see themselves. And obviously, I have a three-year-old, I have a one-year-old, both are getting ready to turn four and two. But as their father, I have a lot more information, I have a lot more experience, I have a lot more knowledge than what they have. And I'm able to see them at good times and bad times with a much greater perspective than they are able to see themselves. And that's a lot how God views us, is God knows everything, he sees everything. He is all-powerful and all-knowing, and he has a certain perspective that we don't have, and the goal is through prayer and thanksgiving for us to have that divine perspective. And Paul is able to hone in on that and see his imprisonment, not more than what it is, but as it truly is, God at work. I am in chains, but yet the gospel goes on. We have a member here, Ralph Smith. Uh, He's an incredible guy. He works um, at our Welcome Center, shares people uh, throughout our church, and um, just a contagious personality. And seven years ago, when I first came here, he said something that always stuck with me. And Ralph's a pretty funny guy, but he's also, you know, he's uh, business-oriented. He's savvy. I mean, he's got a lot of, a lot of good things for him. And his son was there, too, and we were, we were talking this. And here's, what, here's Ralph's uh, saying. Every setback is a setup for a comeback. It's funny, but it's true. That's his perspective. Every setback is a setup for a comeback. And that's how God is orchestrating Paul's life. I mean, can you imagine the greatest missionary in the entire known world at the time, the Apostle Paul, preaching and teaching and evangelizing, has been put under house arrest and he's not able to do it. I mean, most of us would say, man, our hero's gone. The leader of our tribe, the leader of our movement is no more. Who else is going to step up? 
But yet Paul says, this is actually to my benefit. This is actually to the advance of the gospel. The word advance, it literally means this. The Greeks used it to talk about a blazing trail before an army or the philosophical progress towards wisdom or a young preacher advancing in age and in stature. Um, It's like advancing through a forest and your leader takes a machete and he clears the way for for the rest of you. That's what Paul's imprisonment was. That's how Paul was saying it. He's saying literally, my imprisonment formulated the way, prepared the way for my comeback. You know, whenever I drive on the interstate, and um, I mean, you know, I usually drive between 5 and 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. That's just, you know, something that I do. And anytime I get passed by somebody, the first thing I think about, bushwhacker, right? That's what we call those. Other people have different sayings for those, but they're bushwhackers because they clear the way. I mean, if somebody's going 90 miles an hour over the speed limit and I'm only going 5 to 10, obviously they're going to get pulled over, hopefully, and I'm not. They're preparing the way. That's what it means for the advancement of the gospel. Paul's imprisonment has literally paved the way for the gospel to to go on. And that's an incredible perspective on his circumstance and his situation. It paved the way. The bushwhacker for the gospel was the very chains that were on his hands. And here's what's interesting. It is not in spite of our difficult circumstances that the gospel goes on. It is through our difficult circumstances that the gospel goes on. I think everybody in this room wants to be an effective witness for Jesus. We might be afraid of it. We might not know how to properly accomplish that. We might really not know anything about sharing the gospel with other people. But I think everybody in this room has this conviction to share the love and the truth of Jesus Christ with the people around them. Well, think about it like this. So often we try to change our circumstances, but that's really not the answer. The answer is through our circumstances does the gospel go on. And it's because of Paul's divine perspective that he was able to recognize and bring positive aspects to his situation. I mean, whatever came Paul's way, he took advantage of it and he used it as an opportunity to continue his mission. And here's my question for you is what mountain are you climbing this year? What difficult circumstance are you facing? And maybe you're not facing one. Good. Even more so, God should use your circumstance and situation to share the gospel. You see, you are going to have setbacks this year. There's no doubt about it. You're trying to get healthy and fit. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to mess up. Trying to have better relationships. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to mess up. Trying to be a better witness for Christ. You can't become a better witness for Christ if you don't make mistakes and you don't mess up. It simply cannot happen. Trying to get better at your job, you're going to have setbacks. You're going to mess up. But yet it's through those things that you are set back for an opportunity to come back for the gospel. And that's what Paul's teaching here. Notice what he says in verse 13. He's making the best of his own circumstance. He says, here's the first result, okay, of my imprisonment. He gives us three results. Here's the first one. He says, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Because of his divine perspective, Paul's imprisonment in Rome wasn't because of Rome. It was because of Christ. I mean, imagine getting yourself to that point. God, in his foreknowledge, permitted Paul's imprisonment for the advancement of the gospel. And yes, God permits evil. God permits bad things to take place. But God is so powerful that no amount of evil, no amount of distractions, no amount of uh, thwarting the gospel can prevent him from accomplishing his purposes. And I take peace and hope in that. The reality is this. The imperial guard... 10,000 Roman soldiers. They were the only ones that were allowed to occupy Rome. They were the emperor's personal soldiers. The gospel has penetrated the imperial guard and beyond because of Paul's imprisonment. Now, it may not have happened. Paul may have never been able to witness to those who guarded Caesar on a rotation. I mean, person after person for years were having to watch Paul, and Paul was saying, this is actually to my benefit. I mean, think about that for a moment. Paul was encouraged because the real reason for his imprisonment became clear. Man, isn't that just such a deep sigh of relief when you're able to see the real reason and purpose behind things? You get clarity. Things are known. Oh, we say, this is why God permitted that to happen. This is why God calls that to happen. This is why God allowed me to go through this because I reached this point in my life where I was able to deal and uh, adjust to things differently. Now, Paul is so encouraged that he's not only to share the encouragement goes throughout the whole imperial guard, but he says also this, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. The guards knew why Paul was in prison. 
They knew that it was because of Jesus. And all the rest, I take this to mean, and other commentators do, is that it's actually affected the entire city. Everybody knows who Paul is and why he's in Rome. In fact, Paul has appealed to Caesar. He wants to go before Caesar himself to appeal his case, his false imprisonment for preaching the gospel of Christ. Now, if you remember from last week, the Romans, they allowed pretty much any other religion in their area as long as it didn't confront and conflict emperor worship. Well, Paul's going to die because what does the gospel do? It confronts and it conflicts emperor worship. But Paul's going to take it to Caesar himself. That's how much he wants to preach the gospel. That's how much we should want to share the gospel. You know, I was speaking with a brother in our congregation a few years ago, and he told me about the company that uh, he works for in Baltimore and how, of course, they throw a yearly Christmas party like a lot of organizations do. And really, the yearly Christmas party turns into a uh, really just a drinking festival. And the most of people, you know, there they get drunk and um, they're intoxicated. And not that he's against drinking uh, or anything of that nature, but he says, I just choose not to drink at my Christmas party. And I smiled and I, and I said, why? And he said, well, when, when somebody comes up, the first question they ask is, well, why aren't you drinking? And he says, congratulations, let me share with you my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ <laughs> in the most awkward way possible. But no, he's a little bit more tactful than that. But think about that. He uses his circumstance to share the gospel. He uses his circumstance to let God speak truth to those around him. And he's not trying to be holier than thou or uber spiritual. He's just being wise in that circumstance and in that situation to share the gospel. And that's what Paul's doing. He's using his circumstance to share the gospel, to advance the gospel. And all the people in Rome have heard about it. You know, it says in Acts chapter 28, verses 31 through 30 and 31, it says, he lived there two whole years in Rome at his own expense, and he welcomed all who came to him, and he proclaimed the kingdom of God, teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. You can put chains on my wrists, but you can't stop me from preaching the gospel. The last church that I was at, one of the ministers, um, he actually dealt with uh, a husband who was overly abusive and um, went into drunken rages, and he went and he shared the gospel with him at his house, and he sat down and he opened up the book of Proverbs. Proverbs warns us over and over again about overindulgence, whether it be food or sex or alcohol, and this man, he had an alcohol problem. It's just the way that it was. And so he opens up the, uh, the book of Proverbs, and he reads him something, and the guy looks across the stage, and he takes the paper, and he rips it out. So it's not in there anymore. And of course, you know, some preachers can be a little, get a little fired up. I, won't, I will admit that that happens to me too. And he slams his book shut and he says, you can take the pages out of my Bible, but you cannot rip the pages out of your heart. And that's true. You can't stop the gospel, no matter what you try to do. I mean, think about it. The church has suffered the most horrendous persecution that any organization has ever went through, and the gospel cannot be stopped. You know the number one religion that's persecuted in the Middle East? Christianity. Do you know the number one religion that's persecuted in our academia universities? Christianity. Christianity has been fought against and hated against and subjected and imprisoned. Now, of course, people have manipulated it on the other side as well, but you can't stop the gospel. And that's Paul's attitude. And that should be our attitude. No matter what we go through, God can use every situation because every setback is a setup for a comeback. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, and most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord, in my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Not only is the gospel unable to be stopped, but through my imprisonment, people are actually encouraged. You know, people are always watching. They're always looking at you. And sometimes we share things on social media, and so it becomes um, hard not to share. But people's eyes are always on us, whether it's our kids, our spouses, people that we work with. And they looked at Paul, and they had every reason to say, man, I don't want that to happen to me right? I mean, think about it. If legislation passed in the United States, like Canada and other places around the world, and preaching what the Bible has to say about morals and ethics and truth were to become against the law, and ministers started to go into prison, I mean, it would cause pause, right? We would say, man, I don't really know if I want to go to prison for teaching and preaching the truth. But yet, through Paul's testimony, the people around them actually grew bold. It gave them courage, and that's the second result of having the right perspective on your circumstance as it encourages and inspires the people around you. You know, because of Paul's imprisonment of the gospel, the Christians at Rome, they began to follow suit. Well, look at how Paul, 
Look at what God's doing with Paul. Perhaps God can do that with me. And God can certainly do that with you. And we already looked at this. It says that they're speaking the word without fear. Boldness, in other words. It's this word that's contrast with being silent. And you know what? It's in the present tense Greek. And here's what that means. It indicates a continual speaking. We all have moments of courage. We all have moments when we were ready to stand up and share the gospel and we're ready to change the world for other people. And then usually after your mountaintop experience, you kind of crash and you go down. I've been there, haven't you? And you're like, man, I don't really know if this is worth it. Don't really know if I want to do it. But the present tense in the Greek means that they continually spoke without fear and with boldness. They were truly and really changed. They are no longer afraid to speak out for Christ. In fact, in Philippians 4.22, it says, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. (laughs) I mean, think about that. President of the United States, the king, the prime minister, the greatest leader in the entire known world has people in his very own household who have converted to the faith because of Paul's imprisonment. The gospel goes on. That is incredibly powerful. And here's the question, how can we not be encouraged in the same way? If we are willing to let God make the most of our circumstances and our situations, how can we not be encouraged in the exact same way? If God can do that with Paul, he is powerful enough to do that with me. And then here's the third result that he said in verses 15 through 17, Christ is still preached. He says, look, indeed, some preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others preach of goodwill. Envy is the spiteful resentment at the success of others. People actually looked at Paul and they were envious of him. They were spiteful. Have you ever felt like that? You see the highlight reel of other people on Facebook or on Instagram or on social media or at your job and you grow spiteful, you resent their success and you think through being successful yourself, you can actually bring them greater harm or greater pain. And hopefully many of us don't do that because envy is really a wicked, deceitful, nasty sin. You actually want the other person to lose what they have. And that's where these gospel preachers were. And it says out of rivalry, contention, bitter disagreement over personal matters. But then there were some who preached the gospel out of goodwill. They wanted what was best for Paul. Look what he said in verse 16. The latter do it out of love those who preach out of goodwill, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Their motivation for preaching was because they loved Paul. They had a good heart and a good attitude, and they understood Paul's situation. In other words, they didn't look at the terrible situation of Paul and use it as an opportunity to celebrate their good. And we find that in the church. And if you don't find that in the church, you're certainly going to find that in the world. People cannot wait to see you fail. And it takes a very special, unique, godly, wonderful individual that doesn't rejoice when you fail, even when they do, but that cheers you on and encourages you and doesn't seize the opportunity of your weakness for their gain. And that's where Paul's at. They didn't use Paul's imprisonment to humiliate Paul or degrade his apostleship. They used it to advance the gospel with goodwill. Now, could it be true that God has a divine circumstance set in motion for you? Could it be true that God is at work in your life, that he seeks not only to encourage and embolden those around you to preach and teach the gospel and share goodness with others, but that he is really truly at work in saving the lives and advancing the gospel through your circumstance and through your situation, just like Paul. You see, suffering was promised to Paul. Paul persecuted the church for the first three years of the church's life, and he had a radical conversion experience. And Jesus told Paul in in Acts chapter 9, verse 16, He says, I'm going to show you how much you're going to suffer for my name. Apostleship is not going to be easy. And you know what? That's promised to us as well. Paul told Timothy, he says, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It is going to happen. Your husbands, your wives, your kids, your co-workers, maybe even people in this very room will persecute you as you try to grow in maturity and a spiritual relationship with God. It will happen. But there's good news. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 9, we are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. Paul was not left alone in his chains, and neither are you. You're not alone. You're not forsaken. God hasn't given up on you, and he never will. In verse 17 of Philippians 3, Paul says, the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What's their motivation? Selfish ambition. 
Now, I could wish I could say that I've never preached out of selfish ambition, but that's simply not true. There are times where I've taught or I've preached or I wanted to go in the ministry for me, not for God. And it happens. We're sinners. We mess up. And there are other times where I preach the gospel and teach out of love, out of goodwill towards others, out of encouragement. We cannot spiritually abuse people. Some people were spiritually abusing Paul. They were manipulating the situation to afflict him even greater. You know what he actually is meaning by this? To afflict me and my imprisonment? It literally means this, friction. They would use this word of skin rubbing against the iron chains and flesh, the pain that would come along with that. He says, that's what they're seeking to do to me. They want to afflict me. Literally, they want to cause me friction in my life. This metaphor of what it's like for for. for chains to rub against the flesh is what they're trying to do with Paul's life and their circumstance. And they're preaching what is true, but with the wrong motivation. And sometimes that happens. But there's good news. Look what Paul says in verse 18. What an incredible perspective to have on a circumstance, not only of himself, but even of other people. He says, what then? What does it matter? Here's why it matters. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Paul isn't just passively dealing with what's going on at Philippi. He's not just brushing to side the problems that are going on in the church, hoping that silence will eventually carry the problems away. Some might have thought that Paul remained silent and, you know, just preach unity and don't talk about problems in the church and eventually the problems will heal themselves. But Paul writes this letter to deal with the conflict that's going on at Philippi and at Rome. And he's saying, look, one of the problems that we're dealing with is some people aren't preaching with the right motivation, but I've got good news. Christ is still preached. And you know what? That gives me encouragement that even when I'm selfish or even when I fail and mess up, the gospel goes on. The gospel goes on. You might not be perfect. You might make mistakes. You might mess up. But there's good news. Is Christ still preached here? Is Christ still preached in your life and in your circumstance and with your family? I love this perspective that commentator Frank Fieldman gives. He says this, at the end of the day, after all their efforts to oppose Paul, they have only succeeded in doing the thing that matters most to him and the thing his friends also do. They have preached Christ. What an incredible providential act of God that these people were trying to hurt Paul and they actually did the very thing that he wanted most. Sharing the gospel, preaching Jesus in truth and word. Now what did this mean to them? And here's what it meant. His point was that it was more important for the church to be the church than for its members to receive the personal satisfaction of winning. Man, that's a good perspective. It's more important that the gospel goes on than for me to win. And in that, Paul says, even in me losing, because the gospel goes on, I win. It's good. I can rejoice. You see, Paul's mature enough to shrug off his personal animosity and rejoice in the fact that Christ is preached. And I think that we should do the same thing. Here's the deal. There are going to be difficult, life-threatening circumstances to us, and we will face them. But we should look to Paul as our example. Look at how he dealt with no matter what happens, no matter what kind of circumstance that we're in, the gospel in our lives can go on and it can change the lives of those around us. No matter who gets elected to office, no matter who gets the promotion at work, no matter what happens in our family or at school or on the sports team, the gospel can go on. God can use every setback and he can set it up for a comeback, comeback for the glory of God. And that's the truth that Paul is sharing with us. What matters most is, is the gospel going forward? And if it is, then we should rejoice. Now, there are three things that I want to apply to us before we leave here this morning, and here's the first. The church at Philippi looked to Paul, and they were encouraged. The people at Rome looked to Paul, and they were encouraged. And as you climb up your mountain this year, whatever circumstance you're facing, whatever you're going through, it is extremely valuable for you to find somebody that you can follow, for you to find somebody that you can look to and say, he's preparing the way. Look at how he's dealing with this circumstance. Look at what's going on in his life. That's the power of a story. You see somebody overcoming and accomplishing something that is great despite their circumstances, and that gives you courage to do the same thing. And if you can't find anybody, look at Paul. 
Here's the second thing that I want you to take away this morning. It's this. God is at work, not in spite of, but through your difficult circumstances. God's at work. He's at work in your life. You know, the Bible says it was the foolishness of the cross that God chose to save the world. Who would have thought a cross? Everybody wears it, puts it on our bodies, hang it up in the auditorium and throughout the church and post it on our social media profiles. You know, the cross was the most heinous, offensive, nasty symbol that was ever produced in human history. Crucifixion was horrific. And the gospel took the cross and it turned it into something glorious. And the world was changed by it. It's amazing what God can do with things that are foolish, that are despised, that are rejected. God chose the lowly of the world, 12 disciples. They couldn't even read or write. They preached the gospel and they changed the world. God is at work. Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay. That's what we are, he says. We are fragile jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. God can use your circumstance no matter what you're in and show his power, and he is at work. And then finally this, in this I rejoice. God is able to look at your circumstance with a divine perspective. Paul was able to look at his circumstance with a divine perspective, and he was able to say this, in this I rejoice. And that's my encouragement to you this year, is to not to lose your joy no matter what you go through, no matter what circumstance that you're in. In this, I rejoice. Find a way to be happy and have joy about something. Find a way to look at how God can take the advancement of the gospel and use it for his glory and his work and his goodwill, that no matter what people you're around or what circumstance you face, it remains this. God is for us. Who can be against us? Find good examples to follow as you try to climb your mountain this year. Understand that God is at work. You're a fragile human who makes mistakes, but you can't stop the gospel. And then finally, have firm joy. Find a way to give God glory and to have joy with a divine perspective. Let's stand.